G'day guys, it's Nav here from Infinity Cricket. Uh, welcome to another very exciting show. Um, we've got lots um, in store tonight. A very, very special guest uh, with us. Uh, very privileged to have uh, Simon Torfel joining us today. Um, obviously, five-time ICC Best Umpire of the Year recipient. Uh, very honoured to have you join us today, Simon. Um, thank you so much for your time. No, great to be with you and the guys. Thank you. Um, also, I'd like to introduce you to Nuan Ranasinghe, who is um, a regular writer um, for the Raw.com, um, doing some great stuff there and been covering um, many cricket um, series over the last several months. Um, so great to have you back on board, Nuan. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And uh, we've got Ashwin all the way from Bangalore, who uh, is a cricket analyst um, and uh, is quite studious about the game. So uh, thanks for um, thanks for making the time, Ashwin, today as well. Thank you. So, um, guys, I think um, you know. First of all, the, the beauty of cricket, really, it's um, you know connecting people through cricket, no matter what the time time um, you're in, whether it's night or day. Uh, you know, the, the, the sport really um, draws millions um, to follow it. And um, and Simon, someone that has seen the game very closely, um, you know. It very it would be very interesting to kind of understand your journey. Uh, you know, you sort of played a little bit of cricket yourself as a bowler, but then um, somehow got uh, got stuck into umpiring, and you did uh, you know you did a fairly good job of it. Yeah, umpired a couple of games, but uh, Nav, you're right. Cricket's a great game that brings people together uh, across different cultures, different countries, different age groups. You know, uh, when, when I was playing cricket, obviously um, uh, junior cricket played with obviously my peers, but when I started to play senior cricket, I was playing cricket with people that were old enough to be my father, and in probably in some cases, maybe old enough to be my grandfather. But uh, And then when I started my umpiring journey, um, yeah, very much I was very much uh, umpiring with people from a different age group, and uh, that proposed its own challenges and uniqueness. But uh, look, I think cricket does bring people together. I think it's, a, it's, it's something that unites us, and uh, it's a common passion and love that we share. Uh, and I would describe it as, as also creating a, a second family, if you like. And, and for me, as I've travelled uh, both here domestically in Australia and internationally, it really does help having that second family to be supportive and, and, to, uh, and to grow that second network of friends and, and people that you do officiate with, um, which is fantastic. And uh, um, now that I'm, I'm sort of uh, on the other side of the fence and have done some cricket administration, done some coaching, um, now doing some performance consultancy work. It's now time for me to spend a bit more time with my original family, uh, <laughs> reconnect with them, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, one of, the, one of the remarkable things with you, Simon, is, um, you know, you're well respected by, um, you know, by players and uh, spectators alike. And, um, you know, having, having officiated for, you know, 74 test matches, 174 ODIs and uh, 34 T20s, as well as a lot of IPL games. Um, you know, what, 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 is, what have you liked about, um, about those challenges? And, you know, obviously standing, you know, five days in, in test matches, whether it be in the subcontinent or, or in England, the conditions are quite different. And, and how challenging is that, um, you know, just mentally, I guess? We hear a lot about sports people and what they need to go through um, in terms of stamina and so forth. But, you know, not, not a lot is understood about the complexities of being um, an elite umpire, Simon? Yeah, no, I suppose, look, uh, I was set up for success very early on by being uh, surrounded by some great mentors and coaches at the New South Wales Umpires Association. I received a really um, a tremendous amount of support, good advice, good training um, around uh, values, character, technique, um, people skills, um, how to relate to the players, how to respect their roles, um, and if I stepped out of line, you know, normally there was someone more experienced to pull me back and, and um, you know, give me a tap on the shoulder and, and make sure that I was doing the right thing. So um, one of the great things about cricket, as you say, it does test you, it does challenge you. And for me, test cricket is the ultimate form. I mean, no other game uh, that I know of that you compete for five days. And, and the umpires are out there from the first morning until the last afternoon. First one's on, last one's off. Um, the other two sides get to spend half the time off the field, generally speaking. Uh, the, the umpires are out there all the time, but it's a test of character. It's a test of strength. It's a test of stamina. It's a test of focus. 
Um, it's a test of um, patience, um, both within yourself and with a lot of the players as well. And you learn a lot more about yourself. And having spent a lot of time away in the heat of battle, and you've mentioned some statistics there from some of my various forms of the game, uh, it really does, um, you know, uh, teach you a lot about yourself uh, and, and what, what it does take to get the best out of you. Um, but as I said before at the start of that, that response to that question, you need to have a lot of good people around you um, who are in your corner, who are actually there to, to keep you grounded, but to also stretch you and push you and share their knowledge and information with you. Uh, and very lucky to get that grounding here with New South Wales and lots of good colleagues I, st I stood with. But, you know, whether it's people shooting at you, whether it's people appealing to you, whether it's, um, you know, you yourself going back to the hotel room at the end of the day, giving yourself a bit of a beating up for getting something wrong. Um, but today, technology just shows how many times the umpires do get it right, which is really good for us. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely, Simon. And and I think one of the one of the great things that um, you know I've certainly admired, um, you know, following you over the years is is the fact that you do take yourself very seriously. And um, you know, sometimes you do get visibly disappointed when you make the wrong wrong call, right? But I, I feel like as spectator, sometimes we don't understand. Um, as an umpire, you've got a, a fraction of a second to make a call, and um, you know, pre DRS, uh, sometimes that that thought can be hard to sort of put away, right? And and so I guess the question for you is, um, you know, twofold. What, what, what do you personally or what, what did you do when you were dealing with those situations when you know you made um, a mistake perhaps? Or, or and, and then the second question is when dealing um, with players, particularly in contentious situations or, or when um, they're likely to flare up, you've certainly had a very good way of, um, of, of coming across with, with a lot of the players, how do you sort of win their respect and, and also diffuse the situation? Because it's as much about, as you said, understanding yourself and having that support network, but in the heat of the moment, um, it's, it's really about, you know, sort of cooling, cooling tensions. No, they're two very good questions. I could probably spend two hours um, on each of those doing a, a bit of a, a break it down, you know, step by step and, and, uh, walk you through um, some of the tips, tools, techniques and strategies that have worked and some that haven't worked that, you know, people could look at and try to um, try to connect with. But um, I'll try to keep the answer as short as I can because they're just two massive topics. Um, so look on the issue of resilience and bouncing back um, and trying to stay in the moment. Um, number one, just really strong self-awareness that you actually are no longer in the moment, that you're actually still focusing on that last decision or worried about it or, you know, trying to rationalise it or, you know, work out what did happen and, you know, deal with those issues of self-doubt and, um, and inquiries in your own mind. Um, so self-awareness is really strong um, so you can break out of that. Uh, number two, what was your original trigger um, self-talk um, mantra for me on the day? You know, go back to that. You know, get, get back to the here and now. Get back to that present moment and what, what's in front of you um, and really just try to move through that period of time as quickly as you can to say that, okay, look, I might have made a mistake. I might have got that wrong. I'm sure someone will tell me later that I got it wrong or that I did get it right or that it was inconclusive. But I've really got to focus on what's in front of me now. I need to get my mind back where my body is. Um, and there are some strategies to try and do that. Um, so you try to, we would say, park it or, you know, um, put it to one side or, you know, write a little note. I used to keep um, a record of most of my appeals um, on a notepad at the end of the over. And if I wanted to go back and look at something later, I'd make a note. And hopefully that would mean that I don't need to think about it anymore. Uh, it's in the notebook. I'll, I'll go and check it later. Um, but the mind does play tricks on you. It, it does go back to those moments. And um, like most umpires, I rem remember all of my um, biggest mistakes and all those battle scars, as I would call them. But yeah, trying to get through that period as quickly as you can is really important. So that's hopefully a little bit of a, a taster on and something about resilience and bouncing back and staying in the moment. You talked about um, managing players, perhaps, and um, you know, trying to work through difficult situations of conflict. Um, again, I'd probably uh, share with you some tips around uh, effective listening. You know, if someone's got something to say, let them say it. Um, then, if it is not um, going to be resolved quickly. You need to turn that two-way communication into one-way communication and say, look, we really need to move on here. I understand what you're talking about. We're not going to solve it now. We need to get the game going. 
this is what I'd like you to do. And um, language is important. So, you know, if we can use the strength of both of us, depending upon the situation, we would use uh, we and us, and we'd ask for their help. You know, can you help us buy? Go and talk to your players, or can you do me a favour and go and talk to that person about that? Um, and really try to mirror the behaviour that you want the other player or person to respond with. So there's no point in me getting upset um, because if I get upset, they're going to get more upset. If I start to shout, I'll probably start to shout. And um, so there are a number of techniques there to try and manage that conflict, um, as well as, you know, can you leverage off the fact that there are two of you rather than just um, one of you? Uh, can you leverage off some type of professional relationship that you might have with that particular person in question. So look, I never tried to be people's mates on the field um, or off the field for that matter. I tried to have a good working relationship with them. And I was taught very early on in my umpiring career to respect the role of the player and to really not get involved unless it was absolutely necessary. And if they engaged you, I'd engage back. But I would never try to seek an engagement to start with because they were out there to do a job and so was I. And if I had a healthy respect for what they were trying to do, hopefully that respect would come back to me in that way. Um, you know, the role of a player is very tough. Um, there's a lot of pressure on them. And as an umpire, you've got to try and be the calmest person in the room. And that's a really important role that you've got to play. And that when everyone else is losing their cool um, and the crowd's going ballistic and there's lots of noise and atmosphere and pressure, uh, outwardly, you've got to be the calmest person in the room and be the go-to man in that way. So. That's part of the, the challenge that we face. And you know, today with England playing Australia, those two umpires out there have to be the calmest person in that room. <laughs> and um, and look, that's that's actually a very nice segue because it's not always easy to be the calmest person in the room or, or in the stadium if it's, you know, got 80 or 90,000 people screaming. Um, and sometimes, you know, that, that caught behind, um, you know, if you don't hear it, it becomes a big problem. But it leads us on to our next, uh, you know, next um, topic of discussion which is around um, technology. Um, obviously, you've had some strong um, or interesting views over the years as well um, in terms of how technology can guide or assist in decision making, but it shouldn't, um, you know, subtract or detract from um, an umpire doing doing its job. And, and and I tend to agree with that. But with so much, um, you know, with so much data available, um, you know, uh, what people might not realise is uh, in, in a particular study, you might have over 40 different cameras um, at any given time, scrutinising not only the umpires but also the players. Um, you have, you know, Hawkeye, you've got virtual eye technology um, and, and you know, a host of other umpires as well, not just the two on, um, on, on the actual ground, but you've got a third umpire, a fourth umpire, a match referee as well. Um, with the game transforming and evolving, we've seen the evolution of cricket from test cricket now to T20. We've now got, um, you know, broadcasters using every bit of data that they can. Um, the role of the umpire has fundamentally changed. Um, where do you see this going, I guess, you know, five years from now? And, and do you feel as though with the advent of DRS, which is not not exactly precise, but um, certainly helped um, alleviate some of the umpiring um, sort of blunders or that, that was really really the issue there, but then also can be used as a tactical tool um, by the umpires when, when in doubt. Where, where do you sort of see technology either aiding or, or, or potentially detracting from, from umpires going forward? You haven't let me down, Nev. I thought you'd ask about technology at some point, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Uh, look, a couple of key messages on technology, and it's a great topic to discuss. It always comes up, and there's no right or wrong answer to the use of technology. It just depends upon your views. Uh, number one, technology is really driven by the broadcasters. It's not driven by uh, the game's administrators. It's driven by the broadcasters, and they pay a lot of money for TV rights, and they pay a lot of money to suppliers, such as ball tracking, um, such as, you know, Snicko, such as... Um, uh, you know, the, the high-powered cameras that they've now got uh, in place, sometimes up to a 1,000 frames per second. Now, the average camera uh, for most of our broadcasting experience has been 25 frames a second. Uh, you you slow mos around 75 frames a second. As you said, look, roughly 40 cameras, you know, there's somewhere between 30 and 40 cameras now at most international matches. Um, we've got two eyes. 
Um, and that's that's uh, that's unfair competition. So you know the umpires out in the middle tonight are up against um, super slow mo, uh, maybe ultra vision, uh, ball tracker, snicko, um, all these different cameras positions from various parts of the ground which they're not positioned at. Um, and then if they don't pick up something, then you've got three experts normally in the commentary position who will then fill in the gaps for viewers <laughs> to tell us exactly what did happen or what should have happened. Yeah. Um, so the broadcast is a really driving technology and it's really the umpires and the, and the game having to play catch up all the time. And uh, my view on technology is that technology should be there to support the officials and decision making, not replace them. And one of the great things about sport, you know, in, in its organic sense is that, you know, you, you, you build up those skills um, and you advance yourself and the best get to the top. And what I don't want to see happen is, is that uh, the officials are de-skilled once they do get to the top when it comes to decision making, because that's how they got there. And what, why, why not let them make decisions, which is why it's really important that I think that umpires still make decisions. Um, and so there's been some debate again recently around the soft signal um, being employed. We want our umpires to make decisions. Um, technology doesn't always get it right. Sometimes one of those 30 odd cameras doesn't pick up the, the right angle and the umpire still has to rely upon their own instincts, um, vision and gut feel as to what did happen and make the call. And I think that's part of the beauty of sport. Um, it is sport, it's not a science. Uh, we don't want to reduce it to a science. I, don't, I think that would take a lot of the character intrigue uh, out of the game. But you know, it is, it is commercial. Um, there are contracts, there are money, um, you know, purses at stake and, and, and I understand all that. But again, this is the best of the best playing against each other. Um, and it, there's a lot of investment, so I can understand why the broadcasters want to get a return on the investment. But it, look, it's, it's, a, it's an old age question that will continue to be debated for, forever and ever. The umpires need to adapt. Um, they need to look at maintaining their technique, looking at their decision-making skills so they don't need to rely on technology as much as they can, um, while also look at you know, third umpiring roles and for me now, it is the most challenging job in the team uh, from a communication, a decision making, use of uh, replays and technology perspective. Um, and we talked about calmness. Well, composure um, really is number one for the third umpire because you really do have hours and hours of observation interdispersed with a couple of moments of panic. Um, and once that decision is set upstairs, no one will accept that we get an error from a third umpire. So there is that level of expectation that is uh, above everything else. But like all umpires, mate, we start the season, we start the tournament, people expect us to be perfect. And then... And you sort of, I guess, got a glimpse of what the cricket um, or umpiring infrastructure was in this country. Um, are you satisfied with uh, with the resources available for, you know, the modern day umpire today if they want to want to pick it up as a profession? And how have you contrasted that with your experience working in in, in, in India or other parts of the world where, um, you know, perhaps the, the the setup is a little bit different? Oh, Nav, I'm never satisfied. Um, that's part of part of what drives me to, to 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 search for ways to get better and see how we can get better as a team or uh, whoever I'm actually engaged with at the time. I think you know that's part of Part of my DMA, I'm, I'm really never quite satisfied and always looking for, for stretch targets and things to get better. So I've really tried to be a very strong advocate for umpiring um, and for our side of the game, the third team. And I'd like to obviously encourage administrators to always seek to invest more uh, in our side of the sport. Um, not that we should be seen to be equal with the players in terms of profile or prominence, because I think good officiating is all about keeping the focus on the players. Uh, that's what people go to see. But I'd like to see the match official team equally resourced, uh, equally invested in, uh, and equally provided for uh, when it comes to performance. Because, um, you know, we can certainly um, detract from a game when we don't deliver good performances. But when we do deliver uh, top performance, we generally go unseen. So I think that's true for every sport. And I'd like to see every sport um, really strongly consider what they can do better for match officiating, because we always need three teams to play every game. Um, you know, look, obviously the, uh, the official system here in Australia is far more advanced than in most other countries. And we've been lucky 
in Australia to have, I suppose, um, being able to run off the shirt tails of uh, the playing unit, of the team performance unit, to be able to invest more and, and see more resources. But as I said before, there's plenty of room for improvement. I'd like to see more umpire coaches uh, in every state. You know, there are several states that do not have uh, an umpire's coach. Uh, you tell me one state uh, cricket team that does not have a coach, yeah, that type of thing. And so there's plenty of room uh, for that to occur. Education, um, having a, a state training person involved in um, running programs and actually delivering the national program of match official training, both to umpires and referees, uh, is really important. Um, you know, and, and every country's got um, uh, a challenge there and room for improvement. So, look, umpiring is not sexy. It, it doesn't pay the bills. It doesn't bring in the crowds, but it's an important part of the sport. And I'd like to see people um, just really, you know, give it a bit more consideration because, as I said, uh, every game needs three teams. Yeah, some uh, some really good points there, uh, Simon. And, and look, and, and you're absolutely right. There are three teams on on the field, and um, I think as spectators and, and as cricket lovers, we we always want to see um, the standards of umpires um, lifted. And and um, and you're absolutely right. I think it could be an area where technology could um, play a big part in the development of grassroots level umpires in terms of training resources and simulation activities and so forth. Um, but you're right. You know, wherever there's there's a challenge, there's an opportunity, and, um, and and I'm sure that some of those things you mentioned there will be addressed. Moving on to some of the more memorable experiences you've had, um, y- you know, you were at the other end of, uh, of a World Cup final between uh, India and Sri Lanka in 2011. You also watched, um, watched Yuvraj Singh hit six sixes, um, but then you also had some other uh, probably less... Um, um, or, or more alarming incidents, um, you were part of that uh, Lahore um, blast as well um, with, with Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Um, so, you know, maybe, I guess, in, in, in a quick nutshell, the, the good, the highs and the lows, I suppose, of, um, of, of being, um, you know, a, an elite umpire, Simon, um, maybe, maybe talk us through your thoughts on that. Well, look, in every sport, in every occupation, uh, there are highs and lows, and I think part of our challenge is to try to minimise the highs and minimise the lows and try to, you know, be on that level playing field as long as you can. Um, but look, a lot of great memories and a lot of great things, and I'd like to think there's a lot more that I can continue to add to the sport in different ways. And uh, I'm off to, to CPL in a couple of months' time to be a match referee in that tournament. So I'd like to see that I still stay involved in the game and continue to add value to the umpires and the match officials team. And and the sport in general, and I'm very much a, a strong advocate for for, um, for cricket. I'm still part of the MCC Law Subcommittee, um, determining what laws come in and which ones don't. Um, and that's all great. But yeah, look, uh, lots of great memories. Uh, you, you remember all your first, so your first Test match, um, Boxing Day, Melbourne, uh, Australia West Indies. Your first one day uh, back in '99, Australia Sri Lanka. Uh, they're all great things and nice to be able to do those couple of things in Australia with friends and family around me. But, um, yeah, look, World Cup final, uh, certainly a highlight, but probably the match before as well. Um, India-Pakistan semi-final in Mahali was also uh, a fairly interesting game of cricket to navigate our way through. Um, you mentioned uh, the Lahore terrorist attack where, unfortunately, people did die in that event and, uh, you know, people were injured in the Sri Lankan team and um, one of our umpires was... Uh, was uh, very much injured and we lost our driver um, in, in that experience and, and you know here we are today still not seeing international cricket played in Pakistan that's that's not good for anyone but uh, a, a sad day for, for cricket and for, for all, everyone involved in that event um, 3rd of March 2009 but you know on the, on the upside lots of uh, great friends lots of uh, great colleagues that we've worked with and we've We've enjoyed each other's companies with. I've, I've seen lots of different countries. I've been to all the test playing countries in the world, um, as they were back then. Now that we've got Ireland and Afghanistan, who are full members, um, I'm not um, planning on going to Kabul anytime shortly. I don't think. But um, you know, seeing the Taj Mahal, uh, seeing uh, the South Island of New Zealand, um, the beautiful country of Sri Lanka, and, and uh, doing some work with them recently to. Um, help the, the country get back on its feet after the Easter bombings. You know, this is the, the beauty of cricket and the family that I was talking about, that we can unite, come together, we can help each other out when when things don't go 
um, well or someone's fallen over. Um, but also, too, you know, with the World Cup going on at the moment, um, that's obviously the, the centrepiece and the showpiece. We've got the T20 World Cup coming up here in, um, uh, in Australia next year. Look, I, I umpired my first T20 match actually at a World Cup in 2007. <laughs> and going through that final in 2007 in South Africa with India, Pakistan again. Um, what a final that was. I think that was the last ball thriller. Mm -hmm. exactly. And, um, you know, you mentioned Yuvraj Singh and you, you look at the contrast there. You've got the highs of Yuvraj hitting six sixes off Stuart Broad and you've got Stuart Broad probably feeling as low as anyone else on the ground. Um, you know, that's that's the, the nature of sport. And um, to be part of that roller coaster ride is certainly a privilege. But... Um, yeah, something it does test you. It does test you. <laughs> yeah, so I guess um, I guess the last little uh, area which I know that you're quite passionate about is is um, about you know leadership and um, and and I guess when you look at uh, what it takes to be successful at the elite level, um, whether it be as a sportsman, um, as an umpire yourself, um, or it could be in, in in the business or corporate arena. Um, what what are some sort of key uh, you know ingredients for success that that you've sort of picked up over the years that um, that you know might inspire um, anyone that's watching watching tonight, but but also you know potentially some some tips that they can take away. Um, I know, and and also I guess the second question is, you had a conversation earlier this year with um, with Virat Kohli as well, and I know a, a lot of people would be interested to hear your thoughts on. Um, particularly what you've seen uh, to be the, the catalyst in his change of attitude and, and I guess, uh, maturity as an individual as well, um, yep. which might be an example of how people uh, can evolve um, as a person and grow and, and, and develop. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll break it down, keep it really simple for everyone watching to be able to maybe take something away from this. But number one, be yourself. I think it's really important to be authentic and to be genuine and be who you are. Don't try to be someone else. Uh, as we would say, everyone else is taken. Um, so there's no point trying to be someone else. Uh, if you're a cricket player, don't try to be another type of cricket player. Um, be the best person that you can be. And connected with that is that really strong sense of self-awareness. Really understand what your strengths and development areas are and realise that sometimes that your strengths might actually be weaknesses in some situations. And how you respond in stressful situations uh, is a real test of character, is a real test of how your behaviour might change under pressure, pressure under stress. Um, but that, that being yourself, that, that authenticity, that, that genuineness of who you are uh, is really, really important. And, and play within yourself, you know. Um, don't try to be someone that you're not because um, if you can do that, um, at least you are going to respect yourself. Other people are going to know what's um, in front of them. No one likes to uh, walk into a match or walk into a room not knowing which um, Simon and Telfel they're actually going to be, be seeing today. They want to know what, what they're going to get. Um, so be yourself, be authentic, be genuine. Strong self-awareness, as I mentioned, so that you understand what needs to be improved and what you can rely upon in strengths in, in pressure situations. Um, preparation. Very big on preparation. And uh, you know, think about things like, what are my what-ifs? What are my plan Bs? What have I... What have I what are the high risk areas going into this contest, into this challenge that I need to prepare for and be really specific about your preparation? Um, next one would be hard work. You know, uh, Dennis Lilly's motto about success, number one, hard work, number two, hard work, number three, hard work. Um, so I think that's that's just fundamental, but I think sometimes we cut corners, we pretend, uh, sometimes we dream. And that rather than actually, you know, put in the hard work when no one else is watching, because that really determines your success when they when they are watching you. And so hard work really fundamental. Um, leadership, you talked about that. Well, leadership's about, I suppose, getting people to trust you and getting people to follow you. Uh, and sometimes that might mean that you've got to uh, lead from the front and you know be the change that you want to see happen. Sometimes it might mean leading from behind. And actually giving people the opportunity to experience um, being the man or being the person or being the, the woman at the front of the queue and, and, and having a crack and maybe making a mistake but learning from that uh, is really important so not being the same type of leader in all different situations but getting people's trust that um, you are supporting them that you do have their best interests at heart and leading by serving others 
I think is really important because I think there's a lot of selfish leadership that can happen from time to time where it's all about the leader rather than about the people or the cause. And I think that's that's really important. Um, attached to that is the value of humility and realising that you don't know everything yourself and that you need to use the strength of all the intelligent people around you. Uh, put team success number one. Um, and that's really relied, you know, comes, comes through on servant-based leadership. So there's that aspect. And then, of course, you've got those other things that we talked about through this interview so far. We've talked about resilience. Um, we've, we've talked about enjoying the moment, staying in the moment, um, strong self-control. Uh, and then if you want to go into areas like self-discipline, you know, for me, self-discipline is really the area around what it does take to be successful and having that courage to say no to the things that are distracting or no to the things that won't get you to where you want to get to. Um, so look, there, there, there's, there's just a few. Um, I've got a whole list of others which um, I've written about, which will come out later on this year, but they're the things that I'm passionate about helping people uh, to connect with and to explore their potential. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thanks thanks uh, so much, Simon, for sharing that. Um, we've got uh, a couple of minutes now for, for some questions uh, from our panellists, so I might, um, I might open it up to Nuan first, uh, who's based in Melbourne, um, to, to join us at this point, Nuan. Um, got any... Uh, Pertinent questions to uh, to Simon. Yeah, I got I got plenty. Uh, don't know how much time we have in this episode to ask him more. But um, one question I want to ask you there, Simon. Uh, in the uh, Australia West Indies game, uh, we saw a couple of very uh, very shocking umpiring errors. Um, you know, one in one where I believe Chris Gale reviewed twice and he got them both right um, in his favour. Um, and then afterwards, you know, Michael Holding uh, was quite scathing in his criticism towards his umpires, claiming they were weak and that they succumbed to over-excessive appealing uh, from those bowlers. Uh, so my question is, how, how, you know, what causes an umpire to, I don't know, to, to fall well below standards in, in that regard? And what can, um, you know, the panel do to help those sort of umpires and, and make sure they're up to, up to speed with the game? Well, far be it from me, good, uh, interesting question, far be it from me to criticise umpires publicly because I can definitely tell you that I've, I've been there. Um, <laughs> on that particular ground in question, uh, mm. from the match that you've mentioned, mm. I can tell you I had my worst game of cricket uh, ever. And, and that's yeah. part of the joys of being an international cricket umpire is you have your best game on TV mm. and you'll have your worst game on TV. Um, so you really learn a lot about yourself when those, um, those matches come along. Um, what goes into some of those performances? Well, look, um, earlier I talked about preparation and the importance that that plays uh, in, in uh, I suppose, a performance. The, the thing that prepar solid preparation gives you is it, it's a starting a building block of confidence. And for, for whether it's a cricketer or a cricket umpire, you need to have a strong level of confidence and self-belief mm -hmm. to be able to perform at your optimum. Now, on the day, you can still make a decision-making error. Um, whether you're number one in the world or number 12. And, and part of the challenge for that elite panel is to reduce the gap between number one and number 12 and for the whole panel to be moving forward in terms of performance and, and skill level. So um, they will pick the umpires on the day that um, will hopefully deliver their best performance. So it comes down to self-belief and as a coach, as someone who helps prepare umpires uh, for that day, you want to keep the environment nice and relaxed. You want to keep it relatively simple. You want to keep it focused on the challenge and the task ahead. You want the team to be mm -hmm. helping each other and, and in each other's corner. But overall, you want them to feel as though that they're ready, that they deserve success because they've put in the hard work, and they have this inner feeling of self-belief and confidence that they will do a good job. Mm -hmm. So you need to take all those negatives out of the uh, environment and turn mm -hmm. them now, the, the, the challenge with DRS in that environment is you get instant feedback that yeah. you've just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And having to publicly admit that you have to change your decision yeah. and get them to either stay or go mm -hmm. uh, and, and put the arms you know, across your chest, that's yeah. a very public admission that you've got something wrong. Yeah. And then to move on from that and maintain that level of confidence and self-belief mm -hmm. is very much an individual thing. Yeah, and when you're in the middle of that environment and you're on your own, you know, that's, that's, that's something that takes a lot of strength and inner yeah. strength. And uh, how do you prepare people for that? How do you actually help them through those moments? 
And sometimes you've got to go through those moments to see how tough you are or what you need to do to get tougher. Um, there are some things that you can only train for on the job, and that's one of them. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant. I think, I mean, look, I, 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 I never, no, no, no umpire ever goes out wanting to have a bad day. Like, I think I, I definitely empathise with umpires when they do get a decision wrong because, you know, we're all human at the end of the day. Um, I've done a bit of umpire myself, actually. Uh, what's that? No one will ever turn up to a match saying, my purpose today is to get decisions wrong <laughs> and to really bad cricket. They do not do that. Yeah, no, no. I've, I've done a bit of professional umpiring myself. I was an umpire for the Mercantile Cricket, cricket Association in Victoria uh, for a couple of seasons. So, yeah, I know all the, about the pressure, but it's just, um, it was just interesting because I know both those gentlemen weren't trying to make any mistakes. They were trying their best, but I guess, I don't know how I don't know how far into their careers they were with umpiring, but even for me, I just felt it was a bit, whoa, a bit, bit, bit weird. That they were, yeah. we're all going to have our worst game on TV. And yeah. sometimes you've got to reach that low point uh, in a performance mm. to understand yeah. um, that you've actually got the ability to get yourself out of it and to be better. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so those breakthroughs do come from those breakdowns. Mm. So uh, resiliency is uh, one of the key sort of themes here, um, Simon, and, and it's a good question you asked there, Nuan. Mm. Um, I want to go to Ashwin now. I know you've been uh, itching to, to ask a question, mate, so uh, far away. Uh, it's actually funny because uh, before I came on air, I was listening to a funny incident uh, by Anil Kumble, and he was talking about a test series against the West Indies. And uh, it was a three-match uh, test series, and he couldn't get an LBW in the first test match. So what he did was then he invited the umpire over to his net session and then asked Mohammad Kef to get, get hit on the pads purposely so that uh, the umpire could understand what he was trying to do. Um, so yes, Mohammad Kef got hit on the pads as all juniors obey their seniors, uh, you know. And, and then uh, he went and told the umpire that, hey, you know, I don't spin the ball that much. Uh, you know, it's going straight on. And then in the second test match, after the umpire went to the net session, he got a lot more LBWs. Uh, so my question to Simon is how many of the decisions is influenced by the magnanimity, magnanimity of the player coming and tell you, saying, hey, you know what, I'm not doing this, but I'm trying to do this. And, and especially in, in the modern day era, when, when people, you know, batsmen are struggling to pick Rashid Khan or people who can spin the ball both ways, how important is it for the umpire to know what, what is coming out from the hand, probably, uh, you know, equivalent to the batsman? Sure. Uh, interesting question. Thank you. Uh, look, my style of umpiring was to desensitise the player out of the whole equation um, and really not worry who was bowling and who was batting and what the situation was and what the scoreboard looked like. I very rarely would look at a scoreboard. I, I really tried to get very sterile uh, in the environment because whether it's number one batting or number 11, your responsibility is still to get the decision right. You know, So it, it doesn't matter uh, who you get right and who you get wrong. But you know when you get a Tendorka wrong, a Brian Lara wrong, a Ricky Ponting wrong, mm. that there's going to be lots of um, press the following day, uh, mm. more so than if you get number 11 or number 10 wrong. So mm. we, we do understand that. But my style was really to just desensitise who was bowling and batting. It's, it's funny you mentioned Kumble because I tended to umpire Anil Kumble as a medium pacer. So mm. for us, I would normally stand up closer to the stumps. But for him, I actually stood further back, a bit more like a medium pacer because uh, he, particularly the left-handers, you really wanted to try to get that pitching in line with leg stump right. Um, but he, look, Anna was a funny, uh, a funny bowler because everything was always out when he hit the pads. He was just that type of bowler, like most yeah. spin bowlers, I must say. Um, but I remember doing a test match in India uh, one day and he was bowling right arm around the wicket to a right-hand batsman and appealing for LBW. Now... You don't have to be Einstein to work out that most of those deliveries, if not all of them, are going to pitch outside league stump. Yeah. Um, when they impact, then they've got to pitch and straighten to, to have any sort of chance. But most of them were yeah. pitching outside league stump and he was appealing for everything. And I'm thinking, well, that's great. You're getting my statistics up because I'm getting all these decisions right. Um, <laughs> however, I went back to think about, well, I'm... I think we've lost Simon, have we? Because we have we lost Simon? 
Uh, well, I saw it. <laughs> I think his connection. His connection might have gone, but that's all right. It's a, it's, a, it's an interesting question you've uh, you've asked there, Ash. Mm. Um, Hello. 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 Uh, Simon, you're back. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, technology. That's right. <laughs> Good timing. Um, but look, someone must have been giving those decisions out to Comblay for him to keep appealing. But look, I, I think culture sometimes might play um, a role there. But I think look today. You know, with so much scrutiny, with so much broadcasting and camera coverage, and even to the point where we now have got video cameras more and more, more and more involved in first-class cricket, there's transparency of the umpire's decision making. Um, and one of the the real challenges for a match official is to maintain consistency, is to maintain um, a level playing field for both sides, without fear or favour, and to make strong, tough decisions and to make right decisions regardless of who the team is or the situation in the game. So um, I, I think that's just part of what we what we have to do. But um, people will always see through their own lens, their own filter, the result that they want to have happen, and there's not much you can do about that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a fair point. Um, Nuan, any, any closing uh, comments from you, mate? Oh, look, I think it's greatly, Simon. It's just great to have you on board. I think it's always fantastic to have, um, you know, someone who's been around for a long time giving their uh, point of view. Um, just in the future, what uh, what, what sort of further additions or any improvements or what, what would you tweak, per se, in current umpiring sort of standards or procedures to make, you know, to make it a much more seamless, more accurate uh, sort of, you know, uh, decision-making for, for everyone involved? Well, I think, I think there's probably room for improvement in terms of the way that we explain and the way that we we educate the public on interpretations. Yeah. I, mean, I can't think of any match official or former match official today that's part of a commentary team or part of a, um, you know, a vehicle to explain what goes on mm. with officiating and why we do the things that we do. Uh, I think one of the great advantages has been with the third umpire having uh, live comms to air and they yeah. walk you through a decision. I think that's been a really good uh, mm. way demystify the decision-making process and um, sort of just leave the commentary to, to be quiet for a while while the umpire <laughs> actually explains and walks through the decision. Um, but I think I think there's a tremendous opportunity to explain to the public why we do the things we do, why we have a soft signal, why mm. officials do this the same way. Uh, let's talk about bad light, let's talk about interrupted matches, um, etc. And mm. You know, realise that, as I said before, there are three teams at play, and, and I think we could do that uh, a little bit better. Um, but also, maybe we can we can improve third umpiring a little bit by having specialist third umpires and and really try to speed up the game um, by being able to use um, more highly trained officials in that area and being able to get decisions quicker, um, mm -hmm. have less interruptions in that way, um, and keep the focus on the players. I, I think that's part of our challenge. Mm. Yeah, uh, player experience is absolutely the key. Uh, Ashwin, to you, mate, f final remarks and, and thoughts from yourself? Yeah, as no one put it, it's it's perfect and it's it's great to have Simon on board. Uh, Simon, I just have one question for you. Um, every time, I mean, I've done a, a little bit of umpiring as well, so every time I step onto the field as an umpire, uh, I, you know, it itches me to go and tell the captain that it was a rubbish field set or a stupid bowling change that that he has done. Uh, what's your advice to people, uh, to youngsters who once were budding cricketers wanting to represent their nation as players in, in the World Cup? How easy or how difficult it is to transition from wanting to be a player uh, to, be, to becoming an elite umpire? That's a great question. In fact, uh, I think most of us who are, who are umpires these days have played at some point. Mm. And what's interesting in today's elite panel is the majority of those elite panel umpires are former first-class players, uh, as opposed to when I was on the elite panel, most of them were non-first-class players. So it's been quite a dynamic shift. But uh, look, umpires do think differently, and you need to think differently. You, you cannot think like a player. And um, I've seen some former players who have been standing at square leg who initially want to go and feel the ball uh, if it comes close to them. Um, or who maybe want to appeal with the rest of the team, um, <laughs> doing such a thing. So you've, you've got to, it is definitely a shift. It's definitely a mindset shift where you are thinking more objectively, 
you are thinking more around applying laws and playing conditions as they've been written, as they should be applied, rather than emotionally about um, the state of the game, if someone being disadvantaged, et cetera, et cetera, because um, the laws don't talk about that conditions have to be perfect. The laws don't talk about um, that someone's being, you know, um, maybe disadvantaged uh, for a particular reason. If, if you have to apply a law, you have to apply a law. Uh, sometimes there is no discretion. But then uh, on the flip side of that, one of the great arts of being a good umpire is to actually apply some discretion and to give a friendly caution or to, you know, tell them that they're getting close to the line, they need to move away, they need to come back or whatever. But look, come and join the dark side, come and be an umpire. Um, it, it's a really challenging role. We need more umpires in our game. Uh, you learn a lot more about yourself. You do have the best seat in the house. It's a very enjoyable activity. Um, and you do have the ability to really learn a lot more about yourself and enjoy the company of your fellow match officials. So um, it's not as bad as it seems. So if you've tasted it, well done. Um, come and do some more matches. I need some more umpires here in the Southern Highlands. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity here down at Bradman Oval for those who are aspiring to be umpires. And there's a New South Wales umpires course coming up um, uh, very shortly in July, um, being held at Bankstown. So if anyone wants to come along to that course, I'll be going. Um, and if they'd like to learn uh, the, the art and craft of the laws and how to apply them to become an umpire for next season, um, check out the New South Wales umpire site and um, come and join us at the course. If you're willing to sponsor my visa, I'm sure I'm, 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 I'm ready to take the next flight, Simon. Well, uh, Ash, Ashwin's actually um, he's officiated. He's been part of. Um, he's, he's done scoring, umpiring, writing. Uh, he's played cricket as well. He's, he's a bit of everything um, and, and an analyst now as well. So, um, look, uh, Simon, on behalf of Infinity Cricket, obviously connecting people to cricket. Um, absolutely loved uh, having you here tonight. I think we've covered. Um, uh, you know, a, 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 a widespread, wide range of topics, I would say, which is of, um, you know, huge interest to, um, you know, to the people, cricket-loving people that are following um, following us. And so, you know, I'd like to uh, really thank you for your time tonight um, out, of, out of your busy schedule. Um, but more importantly, I think, um, you know, we're very much touched by the, the respect that you show to the game um, the, le the level of articulation you have on um, a wide range of, of topics um, and uh, obviously your contributions to the sport over a number of years as well. So um, that, in our eyes, definitely makes um, you a, a cricketing legend, uh, Simon, and uh, we look forward to your contributions um, to the sport and, and especially, um, you know, inspiring the next generation as well. So on um, behalf of all the other panellists as well, Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, Simon. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to bringing you uh, many more um, content in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate the time and thank you for those kind words. Thanks, guys.